Confession. About 13 years ago, I betrayed the trust of my wife. When Bryce was born 18 years ago, she decided to change her eating preferences. She decided to stop eating red meat, like no more steak, burgers, pork, any of that. And so three or four years into that, we were having dinner as a family with our brand new youth pastor, Chocolate Bear. And we went to Carino's. She went to the bathroom. And I thought it would be fun to maybe get a little street cred with the youth pastor or maybe it was the inner youth pastor and me to, to play a little prank on my wife. So I took some ham and I sandwiched it in between the cheese and her chicken. And I watched her take a big bite. And then I started laughing and asking her if she noticed it and what it tasted like. And she goes, notice what? Tastes like what? I said, well, you just ate a big piece of ham. And I started laughing. And I thought everyone would start laughing too, but they didn't. It was so awkward. And her eyes, she turned from like, Sweet little Stephanie to spitfire mad. Like this is like Jesus righteous anger. I'm like waiting for the tables to be like turned over. She was so upset that I have violated her preference over eating red meat. And, and she said, she just kept saying, why? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And I just, just began, it, I, I understood the depth of the betrayal of her trust. Even to this day, when I get her to try to try something new, she's skeptical. She's suspicious. We've got trust issues. <laughs> How many of you have trust issues? Some of you are saying, like, I have trust issues because people have lying issues, right? And, and trust is, like, you can't have a close relationship if there's trust issues. You can't have a healthy, strong marriage if there's trust issues. You can't have a good boss-employee relationship if there's trust issues. Trust is the glue to a friendship. Trust is the relational currency. It's the foundation. And when trust breaks down, so does the relationship. And if I could be vulnerable, I, I have trust issues with family. Not my immediate family. We're tight. We're good. But extended family, some things have happened in the past that I wasn't directly related with. But I've got I've to take ownership with trust issues. And today, I, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis because we're going to continue this series about trust issues. Last week, we discovered from the life of David that before you can have trust with others, you have to have a trust in God. And today, you're going to discover before you can have trust with others, you have to be yourself a trustworthy person. You see, when it comes to trust issues, rarely does one think of themselves as breaking trust or causing the issues. Usually you think of yourself as the victim. But if we're going to have trust, if we're going to have stronger relationships and marriages and re stronger relationships with each other and small groups in our church family, then we must improve in being trustworthy and, and handling trust in a very good way. So today we're going to discover in the Bible, from the life of a old, another Old Testament character of why trust is so important, why being trustworthy is so important, because the reality is trust is a two-way street, right? It, it takes two. Just like usually when there's a breakdown, it takes two parties, but when you have trust, you, it takes two as well. So today, I'd like for you to just look in the mirror and say, am I a trustworthy person? Do I cause trust issues? Just try to be honest, all right? Like, what in your past or what are you currently doing? Or what about your character may give you a perception that you are not as trustworthy as you think you are? And the good news is that as we open up God's word and we're in the presence of the Lord, no matter where you were at on that range, no matter where that needle is on being trustworthy or not trustworthy, we can all, through the help of the Holy Spirit, through the grace of God in our life, we can become more trustworthy. And how many of you want to be more trustworthy? 
We all do. And so as we look at the Old Testament patriarchs of the Bible, Abraham, his son Isaac, who gave birth to Jacob. These are the patriarchs. But Jacob isn't known for being very trustworthy. He had some problems in his character early on. And we see that. He was a twin in Genesis chapter 29. His twin brother Esau was out hunting and came back really hungry. And Jacob had the family recipe of a good stew and prepared it. And when Esau came out off the field, he's like, I'm about to die. In verse 32, he says, and, and Jacob says, hey, I'll trade you your birthright for this bowl of stew. And so Esau said, what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me on this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. One thing you have to know about Jacob and Old Testament names is oftentimes they live up to their names. And sometimes they're named in a way because of whatever that, um, maybe those, those traits needed for that family. But Jacob, his name literally means deceiver. And so this was a bad characteristic trait. So years pass, their dad Isaac is getting old. And in Jewish tradition, especially with the patriarchs, before they died, they would bring the first, usually the firstborn, and they would give this, this blessing. And with the Israelites, it was a spiritual blessing. Not only would you get the lion's share of the inheritance and all the, the lot of the livestock, but you're getting like the responsibility of taking care of the family, like the spiritual lineage is going to be passed through you. And so as a firstborn, like you're entitled to that. So imagine today, it's like it's, it's the moment when a grandfather or a parent dies and then you're being entrusted with the inheritance and most of the, the, the wealth if there is some. And so that's, that's where they're at. And Jacob and his mom come up with this plan to deceive their, their father at that time of blessing. And so we see in Genesis chapter 27... Verse 18 says, so he went to his father, that's Jacob, and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that you, your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son or not. Now, Isaac had some suspicion, but he calls him near just to be able to, like, he doesn't recognize the voice, but the plan was Esau, his name meant hairy one. So he was, he had hair all over. So they, his mom, Jacob and his mom got like fur from a goat, and put it on his hands. So that's what's happening here in this, in this story. He said in verse 22, So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And Jacob said, I am. So Jacob received this blessing under false pretense. He deceived his dad. You see how this deception of trust not only is affecting him, his mom was involved. Now he's bringing an innocent party, his dad, into this. And now when Esau comes in and he finds out that this spiritual blessing that was supposed to come to him went to Jacob, he goes to his dad and says, please give me a blessing. Jacob said, or Isaac said, no, it's irrevocable. You can't. You, there's nothing for you. So when verse 34 says, when Esau heard these words of his father, he cried out with exceedingly great and a bitter cry and said to his father, bless me also, my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and take, has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, 
Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. How would you respond if your brother deceived you? Not just once, but twice. Have you ever heard that saying, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice, shame on who? Me, right? Like Esau had to feel that way. But notice how Esau responded after being betrayed twice, after trust was broken twice, at least twice. Verse 41, so Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Jacob knew this was going to happen. So he packs up his stuff and he leaves town. Leaves his family, leaves his mom out of fear that his life was at stake. Can you blame Esau for being upset? Can you blame Esau for being hurt? Like he was, the trust was broken. Like he was upset. And we've all had moments where we've had people break trust that we have in them. But again, look in the mirror. Have you ever been more like Jacob, maybe you broke trust with someone else. And so are you, have you had this, this selfish moment? Are you perceived as being trustworthy? Before you can become more trustworthy, then you have to have an encounter with the Lord. And that's what happened in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob, probably always looking over his shoulder in fear of his brother, there's this moment that they're about to, to have a confrontation. It says in verse 3 that Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau's brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find favor in your sight. So this is like that okay corral moment. Think tombstone. Like Jacob's about to have this confrontation with his brother. He's scared. So what does he do? He comes up with another plan. He's like, I'm going to buy my way out of this. So he was blessed. He had all kinds of livestock. And, and so he sends these gifts. These, he's all to, to Esau in the distance. Before they become face to face, he's trying to just give, maybe buy his way out of this. But something had to happen more into his own character. A change had to happen before any chance of true forgiveness and reconciliation could happen. So in verse 24 of Genesis 32, after Jacob sends his family over this creek, he's by himself. And it says that Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. This is the Lord. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him again, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. He's changing his name from Jacob the deceiver To Israel, the blessed, literally means prince. And he said, your name is no longer going to be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Most of Jacob's life, he was a manipulator, a deceiver. He was untrustworthy. But something happened at that creek. Something happened that night where he wrestled with God. And as a result of that brokenness and that moment of honesty, God humbled Jacob and he put his finger on a very tender place of his body, and it, he walked with a limp. 
Forever physically, he would walk with this limp to remind him of the inward change that God did in Jacob's character. Something needed to change inside, and it was his character. Henry Cloud writes in his book, Trust, that there are five essentials to trust. The more you identify and understand these traits, the better you can perceive them in others and live them out yourself. But the first is character. Without character, you can't stand on it. And so character is more than just being honest. Character is, if you're in a marriage, character is being faithful, right? Character is being humble. It's the sum of great qualities. It's being authentic, being sincere. Character is important to trust. The second essential And trust is understanding. It's taking time to listen and understand what someone else expects, desires, and needs. It's not trying to persuade them to something you want, but rather saying, hey, I want to listen to what you expect. I want to really know you. And something powerful happens when someone really feels understood and listens to. You move from a guarded state to an open state. So yes, character is essential, but so is understanding, right? It opens the door for communication. But you can understand, feel, feel like you're understood, but yet question the motive. And the third essential for trust is a motive. Why is he or she doing what she's doing? When you can trust that someone's motive is not in it for themselves, but for the good of others, then everybody wins and profits. So first, it's character. Second, is understanding. Third, is motive. Fourth, is ability. You can't just have good intentions or a good motive. Ability is the actual words and the action. It is the follow through to what has been communicated and expected. And so it's consistent in that, in that action and what's been promised. And then fifth is the track record. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior where there is patterns. You can look. Now the good news is that Jesus through all of us can make us a new creation in him, right? Like the old sin, the old character, God can change us into, from our selfish, sinful nature to a nature that's, that's walking in the spirit of God. That's, our, that's his hope and, and that should be our desire as well. But just as the, the cement to which your feet are on right now are the foundation for this building, so are each of these essentials the foundation to trust. Trust is the foundation to your relationship, to a healthy relationship. And so character plus motive plus understanding plus ability plus the track record over time will strengthen trust. Very important. Does that make sense? This is going to help you so much in, to grow and to be a trustworthy person, but to also understand how these essentials relate to trusting someone. Like if I'm going to trust someone with a relationship or trust someone with my children or my time or money, then, then I'm going to take it through these grids. I'm going to ask the questions, do I feel understood? Do they have a good character? When we ask these questions, we'll know better how to trust people. So let's get back to Jacob and Esau. Because something had to happen in Jacob, his character. And so once he had this moment with the Lord, and the Lord humbled him, and the Lord changed his character, in chapter 33 of Genesis, we find this moment where they lock eyes. They see each other in the distance. And in verse 1, it says, Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men. If you were Jacob, your heart would be beaten, right? This is the guy who's wanted to kill you. You've deceived him. You stole the blessing. 
And so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, and Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Remember, this has been years since they've seen each other. And so Jacob had sent livestock, he, he, he gave gifts to his brother, and now it's a sincere brokenness and out of a heart of humility that God changed him. And now he has an opportunity to like just express himself to his brother who he knew he had hurt and stolen and betrayed trust. So what does he do? He humbles himself and he gets down and he bows down. Can you imagine Jay, Esau in the distance seeing your once proud brother humble himself? And then he gets up. And remember, he's walking with a limp. So it had to be hard to even get up. And so as he, he gets up, he's probably limping, dragging his leg towards Esau. And he gets down and he does it again. And he bows down. And I don't know how long he stayed on his face. But I had to imagine that he was broken and he had to feel great remorse to his brother. I imagine he was weeping tears because of what God did in his life and the desire to to want to see this re relationship reconciled. So scripture tells us he did this seven times. And just as Jacob was broken, something happened in Esau's heart as well. I imagine that he began to weep as too. Scripture says... In verse 4, that Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. So because of this humility and generosity and brokenness, we see two brothers that were enemies. Because of God's work in Jacob, there was a chance of forgiveness and reconciliation. It's a beautiful picture of what God desires, where trust has been broken, where we've been untrustworthy. God wants to, he wants to redeem. He wants us to walk in the light, wants us to walk in the spirit, to, to have character that reflects the character and nature of God. So that in our relationships with each other, there can be redemption. There can be forgiveness. Now, if you're here and you are untrustworthy, and as we pray and the Holy Spirit brings people into your life and your memory where you have broken trust, I hope that we can learn from Scripture that Jacob, he didn't continue to, to run away. But he had a moment with the Lord where the Lord broke him and did some heart surgery. And so for some of you, you need to have that moment before the Lord. Before the Lord. And, and today can be that moment. And tomorrow morning during your abide time can be that moment. But I encourage you, if you've been proud, that you would humble yourself and allow the Lord to do a, a, a work in your life. That, that, that you would have a disdain of being untrustworthy, of being dishonest, unfaithful. And that you would confess and repent to God. And make a commitment to walk forward and be trustworthy. After having an encounter with God, depending on how public your betrayal of trust was, it's important for you to own it, to admit it. Don't deny it didn't happen. Don't think just over time it's going to go away. Don't run away. Don't be defensive of it. Don't minimalize it. Own your part of it. Take responsibility. And then in a very humble way, apologize to whoever felt betrayed by your untrustworthiness by that act, and be specific, and be sincere. And we can know from Jacob that humility, and generosity, and love, that goes a long way. And make a commitment to do whatever it takes to win back that trust, right? If it takes submitting yourself to a process of restoration, if it makes, like over time, like the, the, the motive of the heart, once it's revealed, that you would follow through with ability, and over time you can have a new track record. That's the hope. That's the goal. So my practical challenge for you is to have this moment before the Lord, but this week, take initiative. 
Have conversations with people you've broken trust.